Hi everyone, good evening. I'm Andrea Green, Director of the Visiting Artist Program here at SCAC, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's lecture by Anub Jain, founder of the UK and India-based design studio Superflux. SAC's Visiting Artist Program hosts a variety of artists, designers, and scholars each academic year to foster a greater understanding and appreciation of contemporary art and culture. I would like to thank Anna Jane for taking the time to visit SAC and to share her practice with all of us. I would also like to thank the Robert Lehman Foundation, the Illinois Arts Council Agency, and the Penny Stamp School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor for their support of tonight's program. You can find additional information by visiting the Visiting Artist Program's website at sac.edu slash VAP, where you can sign up to receive e-news, um, find information on our upcoming speakers, and also download podcasts of previous lectures. Um, at the end of Anub's lecture this evening, we'll take some questions from the audience. Our staff will have microphones circulating for your use, so please raise your hand so we can get a microphone to you. And finally, I just want to mention that our fall season will conclude on Tuesday, December 2nd with Swedish artist Henrik Hackinson, whose work explores the intersection of art and science. So please join us for that. Uh, so thank you again for joining us this evening. And now I'd like to welcome to the podium Tim Parsons, Associate Professor in the Department of Architecture, Interior Architecture, and Designed Objects. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's one of the great pleasures of this job to be able to uh, play a part in int introducing you to practitioners who are excelling in fields that we're also excited about. Uh, in my tenure presentation last year, I compared what appear to be two increasingly polarized ways of practicing design today. One, uh, the atelier model, is how you might expect design in an art school uh, to look. Uh, it's experimental values intuition, uh, acknowledges subjectivity, learns through making, and uses design to ask questions rather than prescribe answers. The other, the design thinking model, is instrumental, goal-oriented, values data and logic, learns through observation, aspires to objectivity, and is concerned with planning and enacting solutions. I propose that rather than cozying up with the atelier model, as we might in an art school, we should seek out a productive middle ground that recognizes and applies the strengths of each model for the sake of a richer social, cultural, and economic future. And I can think of no better way to describe the work of Anab Jane's company, Superflux, uh, than to say that it inhabits precisely this territory and proves how fruitful and enlightened intermingling of these two models can be. In fact, it's striking that uh, Superflux div divide their studio activity into a client-facing consultancy side offering bespoke services and a research space called the lab where they develop and test new ideas. Uh, and I found a great Venn diagram from a previous lecture that uh, Anab uh, had given showing where these two overlap and uh, create what they described as a sweet spot of unexpected synergies, new ideas, and provocations. So in a climate where design seems to be fragmenting into ever more esoteric subdivisions of subdivisions, uh, and Superflux appears to have resisted the pressure uh, to tightly define themselves, uh, instead casting uh, their net far and wide. The studio can be found working on projects as diverse as designing prosthetic vision for the visually impaired, building a drone aviary, yes, you heard me correctly, a drone aviary, and contributing to a museum of future government services for the United Arab Emirates, and making lamps that generate electricity from sugar. Anab founded the company in 2009 with fellow Royal College of Art graduate John Arden, and since then Superflux has become a major force in speculative, critical, and experimental design. And while some of their colleagues have developed rather a rarefied gallery-based practice, Anab and John have brought their skills to corporate clients, including Sony, Microsoft, and Nokia, governmental agencies such as the UK's National Health Service, and numerous public venues such as Tate Modern, the Museum of Modern Art New York, and the National Museum of China, among others. Anab is from Ahmedabad in the Western Indian state of Gujarat, where she studied at the National Institute of Design, which, as some of you may know, was set up following advice to the Indian government from none other than Charles and Ray Eames. 
in a film on the Kip Hewitt's website, uh, and now talks about the key message from the Eames report, which still holds true today, that young designers, wherever they are based, need to be aware of the context in which they are working. And she goes on to say that when she was looking for a graduate program, she was searching for a space to bring together magic, alchemy, and provocation on one side, and people, communities, making and building on the other. And in Superflux, she appears to have created that place. To me, it is a Renaissance company run by a Renaissance woman. So please join me in welcoming Anab Jane. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Tim. That was a really kind introduction. I'm so honored to be here today. Um, Today I'd like to take the opportunity to talk about my journey as a designer, as a filmmaker, as an artist, sharing the work I do and its underpinning as aspirations. This is Ahmedabad, India, where I'm from and where I started as a filmmaker over 15 years ago. The film is shot on VHS tape, edited on a linear editing machine, a surrealistic exploration of the urban Indian landscape, of, of repetition and claustrophobia, interlaced with glimpses of hope and desire, in neon lights and dusty landscapes. This is the film I made just after finishing, a nearly silent documentary about Mumbai's hellish suburban train journey that sees seven million commuters struggle to survive on the city's overcrowded train network. Vinayan and I were enamored by the cinematic image, drawn into the stories and lives of people and cities as they played out in the world around us. I like to kind of play this clip through to just give you a sense of what it, was, what it is like for people to commute to three hours every day just to work and back in, in extremely in, inhuman conditions. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to be involved in a more direct investigative practice, so I went on to do my master's in interaction design at the Royal College of Art in London. This is an excerpt from the Yellow Chair Stories project I did at the RCA, where I put a yellow chair and a sign outside my house, offering free Wi-Fi to neighbors and passers-by. It was an attempt to rediscover and invent informal meeting spaces for our evolving ele electronic landscapes. I started offering recipes, free parking spaces, cups of tea and coffee, and started building up conversations with people who perhaps would never have talked to each other through my Wi-Fi network. And after graduating, I was still very fortunate to work with people and organizations where technology and the way it interfaces with, with, the, with the community and with people was constantly interrogated. But as I looked around me, the predominant visual landscape of emerging technology was full of gloss and shine. From the intimacy of our bodies to our relationships and the places we live and work in, all normalized through a steady stream of beautiful pixels, where even a quick, badly done mashup, you can barely notice a glitch. Perfectly created singular visions designed to speak to our emotional subconscious creating expectations and desires, framing our view of technology and indeed the future. There was also this sort of overbearing assumption that as an interaction designer with lots of students' loans, one would work in the service of this landscape, facilitating and living within the conditions that drive this fictional world as a designer, I began to get more and more interested in moving outside of the pixel-perfect imagery to begin to make sense of our alarmingly uncertain, precarious world. Reality is stranger than fiction, and our technological landscape and its implications often too complex to fully comprehend. This is Cujo, a large-scale, fully autonomous robot. DOG, made by Boston Dynamics, funded by the American military, and now acquired by Google. In this video, you see Cujo doing rather well at a test patrol with the US Marines, 
He'd walk for miles across a difficult terrain carrying up to 400 pounds of kit and weapons. From a large physical robot to an invisible one, a Hong Kong VC fund, Deep Knowledge Ventures, has made Vital a computer algorithm, a board member. Vital can make investment recommendations by poring over large amounts of data and even vote on whether the firm makes an investment in a certain company or not. Vital is just a glimpse of how algorithms are beginning to gain autonomy and reveal their agency in unexpected ways. And you probably have seen this latest product by Amazon, Echo. Essentially, a Siri-like personal assistant crammed inside a speaker. We will never be offline again, as machines not just look at us, but also listen to everything we say, storing it in a corporate cloud so our most personal, mundane moments of daily life can be farmed for even bigger profits. A lot of this sort of invisible technology began to get visible following the whistleblowing activities of Edward Snowden, Julian Assange, and Chelsea Manning who exposed the sheer mass of mass surveillance by governments and corporations. Slavok Zizak has said last year, whistleblowing is now an essential art. It's our means of keeping public reason alive. A year on, today we see its remnants in several things, including this recent graffiti in New York. And then, of course, the brief manifestation of their 3D printed caricatures for $99 show how their whistleblowing activities have now been fully consumed. Another side of this technological landscape are stories of small groups of people doing innovative products and services that might previously have re required the brute force of a corporation. For instance, this is the Bento Box, a brand new DIY biotechnology lab in a box, which allows artists, DIY biologists, and everyone who's curious about the technology to do all sorts of DNA analysis that could be used for testing organic food at home or identifying genetic fingerprints and diseases. And then this is the website of a brand new organization called GeneCoin, who has an absolutely astonishing plan to create a new kind of currency made from your very own DNA. This currency will then be distributed across the planet using the powerful Bitcoin cryptocurrency network, which apparently is the safest way to store your genetic data. Whilst this feels so incomprehensible, this seems to be the direction we are moving forwards in. And finally, we see the rise of new kinds of guerrilla innovators and super empowering individuals. For instance, these are members of the Athens Wireless Metropolitan Network installing their satellite dishes to build their own internet. They started in 2004 because the government was not able to provide good internet services, but following the whistleblowing activities and the revelations related to that, many people have joined the network because they want to control it. They want to control what they do on the internet. It's this very same ethos of guerrilla innovation used by Libyan rebels for what I call Jugard warfare where they had game controllers to control the DIY tankers to fight Gaddafi. And as you dig deeper, you start realizing that information in itself is political. And those obfuscated by the state use powerful, deeply inspiring ways to create new kinds of access for it. These are members of the Fighters for a Free North Korea at the border of North and South Korea, about to release 20 feet long, narrow, giant helium balloons towards the north. Each balloon carries a bundle containing DVDs, transistor, transistor radios, USB sticks, and tens of thousands of leaflets printed with information about the world outside North Korea. And the sun sets on a group of African migrants on the shore of Jibati city at night who raise their phones in an attempt to capture an inexpensive signal from neighboring Somalia a tenuous link to relatives abroad. 
Yet another story revealing the old tension between political and economic agendas of governments and corporations and the liberties of the marginalized who have now found a powerful new medium in cheap technologies to fight with. But the list goes on and on and on. As I began to look around me, I felt I was only scratching the surface. If you're into this sort of thing as my friends and I are, you're likely to become overwhelmingly swept away by the torrent of news bites on Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, newsletters, blogs, and so on. Drone wars, Minecraft smart cities, wearable solar panels, crime predicting software, it's endless. And it can be very, very overwhelming. In a recent essay, Adam Curtis sums up this condition really well. We've got this idea that we have screens around us all the time, and we see everything, and we somehow know everything that is happening in the world because it is reported to us 24 hours a day. But actually, we also have a sense that we haven't got the faintest idea of what's going on. The new sensibility at the moment is a sense of isolation, unconnectedness, a sense of what the hell is all this for, and a sense of uncertainty and anxiety. The UK organization Plan C are taking this very seriously. They even have a manifesto called We Are All Very Anxious. Here's an excerpt from it. In contemporary capitalism, the dominant reactive effect is anxiety. One major part of the social underpinning of anxiety is the multifaceted, omnipresent web of surveillance. The NSA, CCTV, performance management reviews, the job center, the privileges system in the prisons, the constant examination and classification of the youngest school children. It goes on and you can check them out. But the most fantastic thing about the present time is that we are actually still here, said William Gibson in a recent interview. And operating within this context is our little design studio, Superflux. That's my partner, John, and I doing a ridiculous photo shoot for a Wired magazine. We are designers, mostly interaction designers, product designers, strategic types, but we're also artists, filmmakers, technologists. As Tim mentioned, we operate as part consultancy or a design shop, helping with future visioning, strategy, and product invention for emerging technologies. But we also have the other part called the laboratory, exploring methods, materials, researching and investigating emerging technologies and the broader context within which they live. We have set this agenda for the lab because we know that technologies don't exist in isolation. They interact with a rich and complex world and are subject to forces beyond their maker's control. As designers, we believe it is important to think about the wider field of complexities in order to challenge deeper assumptions about technological power and control. To do this, we, create, we work to create tangible expressions of how these complex landscapes might manifest themselves in the near future. But these expressions, whether they are in the form of interactive prototypes, films, stories, or scenarios, are not so much about the future, they're more like lenses with which to view our present. And it's these insights into the granular materiality of our strange presence and alternate futures and the new perspectives they bring that we are most interested in. And in today's talk, I'm going to present a few projects from our lab. So one of the first projects I'd like to share is about the design of augmented prosthetic vision for the visually impaired and the blind using a technology called optogenetics which is a combination of gene therapy and optoelectronic prosthesis. I let our scientist collaborator, Dr. Patrick Degenar, explain. Patients who have other different doses of light, because the light sensitive cells in their eyes can function. The remaining circuitry is, however, intact. Patients with other doses of light are able to see and hear with the remaining circuitry intact. The remaining circuitry is, however, intact. In 2003, the discovery of a special light sensitive protein, algae, led to the new field of optogenetics. We can use these special light sensitive proteins to bring back some form of focus sensitivity in the remaining cell layers of the retina. My team is developing a special optical electronic headset to interpret the world and communicate with these newly light sensitized cells. It is our hope that we've got the mixture of optogenetic gene therapy and our headset 
that we can return lost vision to these patients. It's quite a complex technology. It is invasive in a sense that you are injecting a virus at the, in, at the back of your eye using gene therapy and you're restoring sight using this sort of technique. However, it's also very pioneering. And they started using a lot of tests, a lot of image augmentation tests with the visual impaired people to see if they were to start seeing the world again, what sort of vision would they like? Would it be some sort of a cartoonized view of the world? Would it be the outline of objects? Would it be a Tron-like image? And so on thinking that people who can't see should at least feel better to get some sort of a vision. Much to their surprise, people said, I'd rather be blind than have my world look like this. As scientists, they are approaching it from a very data-centric perspective, whilst as designers, what we often ask is, what our experiences often with technology will feel like, valuing human centricity over efficiency? The most interesting part of this technology for us, for us was how the body is being modified better to better interact with a machine rather than designing a machine to interface better with the human body. So we decided to explore the design for the operating system of this new interface, taking into account the deeper connections between such prosthetics and the brain's most vivid functions, that of memory and consciousness. What if we gave people with this prosthetic the potential to see in areas of the electromagnetic spectrum not visible to the normally sighted? Now, this was something that technology could do, but they had never considered. So we actually worked with specialist camera equipment to film in these different spectrums and get a real sense of what it might feel like. These are images of me and John. Uh, whilst the infrared lens gave me white skin and blue eyes, the UV exposed John's misadventures with the sun. I'd like to now show you short clips of a film where we show how a protagonist using this new kind of prosthetic vision starts to see the world around him. See you then. Bye. of an exercise worked really well with the scientists because they started to see their own science in a new light and it was also really exciting for us because we are able to shape the design of the technology before it becomes a product and moving forward we then started getting involved in a very practical design process doing ethnography user research and product invention to start creating the actual outcomes Another project I'd like to talk about is around quantum computing. So these men are the world's pioneers in quantum physics. And they're building this, a massive quantum computer. So they invited us to gain a wider understanding of their work and its implications. 
It's very intangible. It's lots of machines, but what they're doing, the kind of ridiculously fast parallel processing that a quantum computer will do is still extremely intangible, and what it might mean to us is also really intangible. So how do we talk about that? How do we get young people, children, students interested in this field? We started exploring the many worlds theory by Hugh Everett, which is sometimes also referred to as the fifth dimension, which sounds very counterintuitive, but we were really interested in it as to how you're able to see the four dimensions of time from the fifth dimension so that you can start seeing how time starts branching out. We also spoke to David Deutsch, who's a leading expert in this field, who said, the fact that answers obtained from a quantum computer couldn't be obtained from anywhere else will make people realize that, that, op, that the way they were obtained was objectively real. Nothing more than that is needed to lead to the conclusion that there are parallel universes, because that is specifically how quantum computers work. We had to make this tangible, though. So we asked a simple question. What if we could see the world from a fifth dimension? Like how a quantum computer is meant to access the many worlds of binary information within itself, could we visualize a machine that could access the many possible worlds that branch out from our own timeline? Here's a schematic representation of how this photographic device might work. It takes a snapshot of range of possible worlds that branch from a moment the camera timer has started and to the moment that the camera actually fires, doing parallel processing just like a quantum computer might. And then we built it. Well, we built a fictional device that very much su suggests what it might actually be like. A fictional device which shows what it might be like when some of these possibilities around quantum computing move from the laboratory and start to influence our everyday lives. Here's a view of the object from the back showing its viewfinder. But along with the prop, we also created stories of people who we imagine might start photographing their mundane lives with this camera in, in order to help the wider public suspend disbelief. For instance, this is a retired Londoner, Nolan, living in a modernist flat who decided to respond to the scientist's open call and adopted the camera for a few days. Nolan started by taking photographs of the empty corridor outside his flat. And soon he started developing a fascination for the images of the many worlds revealed from the strangely mundane to the rather darker side of things. And each of these images is time stamped, so they're from the same time, but in different worlds. Another person who takes on this challenge is Molly, who works for the housing department and spends most of her time answering calls from angry citizens. The scientists bring the camera, set the timer, instruct her to face, face it, and write down the most memorable event of a day. As the camera fires, it brings back images of what Molly might have done in other worlds. Most of them seem equally mundane, except for something like a fire, or someone else in her place, or her not being there at all. We took the camera to various science fairs and were surprised by the responses of the children. We conducted workshops with students where the camera became a prop to explore a world. Would placing it at a high vantage point reveal new knowledge about the Earth? Could it help us better understand climate change, prob probabilities for floods and asteroids, things that we had never considered before? Here we are in our travels from science and music festivals to MoMA's Talk To Me show in 2011. This sort of public engagement of different scales is paramount to our work because as Catherine Hale says, it's not what the future holds, but the implications of this perspective for the present that are highly consequential. And in one particular project, we made this our entire focus. I did this experiment where I assembled a heist-like cast of people, non-designers, non-artists, from different backgrounds, to create a collective optimistic visions of the future. Here's a video call that I made for inviting the participants. Power of eight, take one. Hi, 
My name is Anam and I am a designer. I have recently secured funding from the Arts Council England and the Waterman's Gallery in West London to do an exciting project called The Power of Eight. It is a collaborative experiment in designing our future and this video is a call for collaborators to come on board and join the project. So what is it about? Like many of you, I too am a bit perplexed by the current gloom and doom surrounding the economic crisis climate change and many other foreboding threats of war and terrorism. I'm beginning to wonder, what is the future I have hoped for? And where does it collide with these gloomy projections? And I'd like to ask you, what are your aspirations and dreams of the future? The power of eight is a chance for us to build and rearrange our visions of the futures we have imagined, together. If this is something together, or to explore another point of view, or perhaps build valuable tools. Yeah, so I did that call and <laughs> actually some people responded. Here we are, trying to do this experiment. Question is of course, how do you bring people together who have potentially conflicting views about what a positive future might be? We started off with some sort of a guerrilla summer school kind of thing, working in our bedrooms, cafes, and pubs. Through intensive workshops, we experimented with ways to give each of our individual aspirations a space to grow, more importantly, building trust. We started with a simple question, what would you like in the street outside your house 10 years from now? And then we opened up that question to the wider community of Brentford, where we were located, and put a landscape of uh, tools and sorts, all sorts of maps and asked people to start building a more physical model of their future landscapes. So the participants poured over the map, populating it with source simulators, solar powered airships, public free Wi-Fi boxes, new microeconomies, and so on. A landscape of fantasy and conflict, addressing some of the dilemmas we face around climate change and sustainability. These ideas then manifest themselves in this fictional town called Acres Green. Whilst it was our hope to create something optimistic, what emerged was perhaps slightly problematic, a haunted alternate ecosystem of strange machines and modified nature. One of the key ideas we developed further was called Beamer Bees. This was because colony collapse dis disorder or the dying bee phenomenon was one of the key underlying concerns that emerged within the group. We wanted to address this concern through a provocation. So the nanobiotechnologist in our team helped us create a sketch for a synthetic bee that would pollinate our crops once natural bees phase out. We even made a con convincing diagram of how this beamer bee would be created from the plasmids of five different creatures, a fish, a chameleon, the swift, a bat, and the hawk. We imagined various positive uses of the super bee, from pollinating crops in urban gardens to being kept as glowing pets. Of course, we were not so sure about wanting to mess with capricious living systems, but creating these prototypes encouraged all of us to think more deeply about the world of biotechnology and synthetic biology, where nature is currently being designed. We realized how important it is to create tangible visualizations of these new organisms as they start infiltrating our real environments. Especially in the context of what's going on within the military. So on, on the left is the US military's insect cyborgs project, where they're either hacking real insects or creating insect-like surveillance weapons. Within this context, the beamer bees took on a whole new meaning. This is the final show for the project, showing various different ideas, stories, and films. The narrative of Acres Green had placed us somewhere between hope and despair. Paused in time, we were depicting a world in which progress and decay, as well as technology and nature, coexist in a fragile, uncertain balance. Ultimately, none of us felt completely co and entirely comfortable with this new fictional world, but we could all see parts of ourselves in it, a bit like the future. 
The reason to do such experiments has been framed really well by Nils Gilman, who says, creative imaginings of the future offer resistance to the dominant world order, but also reveal the limits of that resistance. This is really explored well in a project that John did called Our Kink. Placed within the genre of superfiction, his extreme scenario was created in 2006, but remains relevant today. Let me start by reading a letter from someone called Helen. Hi, the hurricane season is fast approaching and is still bearing disturbing post-hurricane Ike memory parts in my mind. It had pained me during the hurricane Ike to see people kill each other in lines for gas stations, while some stupid teeny bopper demanded gas so she could plug in her hair straightener as a to the generator. I have no money and I'm racing the clock to find work in this almost extinct economy. But I have some ideas about non-energy sucking beauty products. And so I'm very in imp interested in working to develop an ARC collective in Houston. Can someone contact me about how I could do that? She wrote this letter to ARC Inc whose website claims that it's a company that creates investment platforms and design solutions for a post-crash civilization. Surely it can't be real. It was. John designed arcing to question the means, as a means to question the lack of response to the growing climate change related concerns. He created mundane products that are designed to fit comfortably in the domestic environment of the current techno-economic paradigm but ones that also possess a set of covert properties to be activated, cultivated, or harvested when the point of crisis hits. Amongst others, his post-crash portfolio had a stylish radio that turns into a solar-powered audio and data transmission device. Books such as Collapsing Society and Pets as Protein that prepared people for a post-crash world and offers for holidays in apocalyptic landscapes, a sort of disaster tourism. The narrative continues to strike a chord with people around the world with whom John has built several conversations now. Another short project around a similar highly contemporary concern is Open Informant, a short project, a two-week project we did last year. So we know that the NSA, GCHQ, and many other government security services secretly collect and scan our personal information and correspondence for trigger words. Some of them are displayed here, from the overtly malevolent anthrax, assassination, and bomb, to the seemingly benign pork, dock, storm. These revelations have not just exposed excruciating details of this activity, but also confirmed the extraordinary disconnect between the scale and seriousness of, the, of what's been revealed and the scale and seriousness of the response. Such techniques are often justified with an emotional narrative of safety. In the UK, William Haig said, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Statements like this act to control the narrative around surveillance and close down public debate on the complexities of the issue. Our response, Open Informant, wants to confront this narrative. It's a phone app and an e-ink badge that searches your communications for these NSA trigger words and then sends text fragments containing these words to the badge for public display a form of open protest to say what is being taken from us by stealth is now being made public. Here's just a short video of how it works. And there's also the GitHub link if someone wants to build it. So this project is, is, was, was, the commission was to do design a wearable, but wearables are so much also about what's happening around us, not just monitoring our bodies. So I'd like to move on to another complex project we did, which we are very close to actually. It's situated in the UK and within the context of free national health care, known as the NHS or the National Health Service. For over 60 years now, it's been a point of great pride for the country. Here's how it started. This leaflet is 
coming through your letterbox one day soon. Or maybe you've already had your copy. The new National Health Service starts providing hospital and specialist services, medicines, drugs and appliances, care of the teeth and eyes, maternity services. Ask your doctor now if he'll look after you under the new scheme. Now don't forget, choose your doctor now. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> but for the last few years, there has been a trend towards privatization through stealth. Parts, the different parts of the NHS are slowly getting privatized, and there has been a protest, but not much effect. Where there is privatization, big data is not far behind. Many nations, including the UK, are creating DNA databases of entire populations, not just criminals. For instance, UK's Caldegard Committee proposed new rules for data sharing, which would allow the government to build a DNA database of the whole population of England in the NHS by stealth, which many have likened to the idea of a genetic panopticon. DNA has Im immense commercial value and is beginning to get mon monetized in new ways. The California-based personal genomics company 23andMe have been granted a patent for a technology that supports their family traits inheritance calculator, which will allow couples to see what kinds of traits your child might inherit from you. Apart from a child's eye color and ear wax consistency, you can also select a child with longest expected lifespan over least expected life cost of healthcare. This rise of genomics in healthcare, which will mean individualized treatments and development of new genetic therapies, but is also closely watched by insurance companies and pharmaceuticals seeking to profit from our very own genetic data. On the other hand, we also see extreme measures that people already undergo in order to secure even basic healthcare. This 59-year-old man who has been jailed here in the US on charges of larceny after allegedly robbing an RBC bank for $1 so he could get health care in prison. With a growth in his chest, two ruptured discs, and no job, Veron hoped a three-year stint in prison could afford him the health care he so desperately needed. Dynamic Genetics versus Man is a project where we explore some of these economic and political implications of genomics, synthetic biology, and gene therapy. It's located in the UK and centers around a near future fictional court case between Dynamic Genetics, a multinational biotech corporation who accuses the unremarkable Arnold Mann of obtaining unlicensed copies of the company's patented gene therapies. Let me show you just some of the 31 pieces of evidences we created for this court case. So this is the leaflet and the sample from the DNA mapping department of the newly formed National Health Insurance Service, not the NHS, which has now become the National Health Insurance. Man was one of the privileged few to be selected for a first round of genetic sampling for the new government database. This is the mandatory spit kit which he was sent. This is the letter from Arnold's DNA results showing that the algorithm has classified him as healthy and comfortably average. But further down came a short caveat. There are some elevated risk indicators. A letter dated few months later shows his NHI contributions bill which has bumped his annual health insurance from 247 pounds to 6,127 pounds and 20 pence. An unaffordable amount for a man already living at the edge of his means. This is the cost benefit algorithm used by the government to calculate every individual's insurance contributions based on the potential healthcare costs associated with their genome. So, it will, the algorithm will scan your genetic data if you're likely to have heart diseases, cardiovascular problems, diabetes, you're likely to cost more to the government and hence you have to start paying more money. 
This is a covert surveillance photograph from inside a black market clinic showing man getting an illegal gene therapy treatment done that would alter his genetic composition so that his insurance bills would go down again. His treatment was apparently done by using the stolen dynamic genetics patented vials as source material. And these are a batch of counterfeit therapies found in the clinic. A forensic photograph documenting the layout of the crime scene. On the right, you see an improvised CO2 incubator, which is used in the manufacture of illegal genetic therapies. This is a, G this is a detail of the genetic therapy. Boxes containing mice, which appear to have been used as test subjects. Sections of the defendant's machine-readable DNA with matches to dynamic genetics copyright material highlighted in yellow. Newspaper articles showing how the government does not support such black market practices around gene therapy. And footage documenting the defendant's interrogation. The lens of the court case as a superfiction mirroring real world current organizations helped construct a powerful narrative to expose the story of a vulnerable citizen who goes to extreme measures to mitigate the impact of healthcare costs. Here's how a detailed and carefully crafted body of evidence looked. Each exploring the politics of power and control in a troublingly familiar future world. Piece together these evidential fragments question ethical, political, and economic implications of innovations in biotechnology that are quietly transforming the world. And finally, the project I want to share is called Drone Avery, as Tim mentioned. It's a work in progress. We are exploring the emergent cultural significance of the civilian drone and its identity as an object of power. So today the word drone is heavily loaded term, simultaneously a mascot of risk transfer militarism, an artifact of celebrity obsession, a DIY enthusiast dream. However, whilst technological wonder and privacy concerns are busy polarizing opinion, there's little real contemplation on how the presence of these machines will change our lived experience of the urban environment and the way we understand and interact with algorithmic intelligence. All drones carry the burden that comes with being an instrument of tremendous power because of their ability to fly unimpeded through three-dimensional space, obtaining unique vantage points, collecting data from those vantage points, and acting upon the power afforded by that data. And that's the bit that interests us. Our project is an investigation of what happens when machine intelligence finds a body and begins to occupy the sky above our heads. Because as J.M. Ledger has said, we talk about atmosphere, stratosphere, airspace, but none of the words say much about the porousness between the rooftops and the clouds, the bit of the sky we breathe, walk through, and look out upon. Led by John, we have spent time getting under the hood of this technology, building every single part of the drone in-house to truly understand what these machines are like. We also created a philology of the drones, seeing their historic origins from RC copters on one side and the military use on the other side. Besides the tech, the form of these machines also becomes important. How do we design their aesthetic to move beyond the visible quadcopter image that we see? In the first instance, we are designing five drones and giving each of them unique identities. By giving them form and identity, we want to start creating a visceral connection between these new species as they become part of the city's ecosystem, roaming the sky, sniffing data, performing tasks with increasing autonomy. This is the first drone, Night Watchman, the surveillance drone. First deployed in 2011 in London, these roving semi-autonomous CCTV platforms became popular with the city authorities 
by providing not just a cheap alternative to human patrons, but also giving a revenue boost for digital finding for community or antisocial behavior violations. The root hawk, root hawk traffic management quadcopter, with close to three dozen root hawks being operated across the smart city, these mobile traffic cameras help manage congestion, cut down road accidents, and car crime. Madison, the floating billboard whose strength, apart from its eye-catching 360-degree LED display, is its highly targeted approach to advertising. Constantly scanning and analyzing crowds in terms of demographics, it positions itself to provide maximum exposure and deliver highly personalized marketing to individuals. We are also investigating the new vertical and digital infrastructures within which these machines will operate. So Amazon recently asked the FAA for permission to test its Prime Air drone service on the basis that they're going to use geofencing, that is digital boundaries, to keep their drones in an electronic box below 400 feet. A consumer drone called Phantom DGI already creates geofences, for instance, a 15-kilometer radius of Tiananmen Square in Beijing, and now to 360 airports around the world. So we started sketching the frameworks for these new digital infrastructures. Unlike an air traffic control map where all flights fly way above the city, we need to think of a map where the drones fly sometimes through the city, between the buildings, above the people. This is the map we are developing, which is not a factual diagram. It's our way of giving excruciating detail to a system that will need to be in place, even if there are few drones flying above our heads. By 2016, they say there are going to be 30,000 drones in the US skies. By giving this invisible infrastructure form, we want everyone to look at it and wonder, what exactly are we signing up for? A close-up starts to reveal the various zones. We have divided each kind of drone into different zones that they can fly in. There are charging stations, there are sort of uh, landing pads, etc. And I'd like to now show a sh short film where we explored some of these th themes through three drones. Um, in, it's sort of juxtaposed with archival footage from newsreels and fictional YouTube videos. And we're going to continue to develop this project for an upcoming show, the VNA Museum title, All of This Belongs to You.
person in drag. <laughs> Here's a studio as I finish writing this talk, the fiery orange, a physical metaphor of our, phys of our philosophy and ambition to see the world in a new light, to create an emotional connection with the raw weirdness of our times. Thank you. And yeah, I'm supposed to say if there are any questions. <laughs> Um, so I'm a little confused about the drone project. It was very scary. Um, are you supposed to, what are you trying to do? Like raise awareness of the future of what these drones could do or change people's perspective on how we're being watched? I'm just like a little confused on the end goal. Yeah, all of, the, all of that, I suppose. Um, um, are um, never in a project do we have a direct saying that this is what we want you to understand out of it. What we want to present, in fact, is a landscape which is messy and confusing, and we want to start uh, encouraging people to draw out their own inferences. Um, so if you think this is a scary world, you may want to go and investigate that. If you think this is exciting, what does that mean? If, if that, yeah, that's the idea. It's not a kind of a single message. Hi, thanks, that was a great lecture. So the, um, the work that you've just shown us, you said you had to, this was for a project at the V&A in London. Can you talk a little bit about the venues for the work that you do and are there venues that are great or are there opportunities that you'd like to have more of? Or like, how do we come across work like this? Yeah, um, that's a really good question and it's something we struggle with because um, um, when it comes to commercial work, there's a specific venue. When it is our lab work, it's often self-initiated. So we have to go and try and find the venues or, and the funding and the spaces where we can show it. And quite often, we do end up showing it in gallery and museum spaces. But um, we're also constantly questioning that right now because we feel that that addresses, um, puts the work within an echo chamber of people who probably already get it and understand it. And so our biggest challenge and interest right now is to move out of that. And well, how do we find new audiences? How do we scale our work? And how do we translate the thinking that we are doing to address uh, groups of people who might not perhaps have thought about this before? Um, the VNA thing happens to be a venue. We've very recently, we've also considered hiring a car park and doing a show in there. So we perhaps might do that. So, you know, 
we we want to try do new ideas. Thanks. Thanks a lot for coming. Um, but this is an art school. <laughs> so <clears throat> it's really difficult for us to be like, oh, yeah, it's for your interpretation only. You know, if we did that at a critique, we'd be in trouble probably. Mm. Um, and I think it's hard for us to get money too if we said that. Like if I was uh, proposing for a project and I said, oh, yeah. I have no actual interest in what I want you to hear from my work, just for more thinking. It's like f purely philosophical, I guess. Um, I wonder how you deal with that, because you seem like every project seems like it's funded by the uh, England Arts National thing, and how that um, how that has to do with what you're even talking about. You're talking about like New World Order, like complete surveillance and everything, but they're just fine with it and funding you. Um, I think that's what would be an interesting question for artists here. So I think there are different parts to your question. I think uh, uh, design is political and you have to have an opinion. So I think if you're an artist more so, um, and you are doing the work because you believe in it and you you're not just doing it because you want to do it, you're doing it because these are the concerns you're trying to raise. So I think that's fair to do, I think. Um, in terms of funding, Arts Council, you have to apply, like hundreds of thousands of artists apply for projects, and you, you get lots of rejections, we've got lots of rejections, we've self-funded projects in the past from work that we, um, from other work we do. Um, in this instance, it is funded by the Arts Council, and. Uh, I think even though the arts funding has cut has been cut in the UK, it maintains a progressive agenda. So a project about surveillance can get funded by the Arts Council because it is questioning what establishment is doing. Um, I think there are lots of projects that artists are doing in America around those themes as well. I don't know if you get into this, but how does the... Um um, the whole legal end of privacy, and uh, did you touch on that at all? Because it seems to me alarming that uh, the privacy laws and protections are lagging far behind technology. Um, yeah, no, you're right. It's um, uh, it's an ongoing battle. I think I think we almost feel feel we are beyond privacy in some ways that we have signed up to this. I think what's more important is to create a real technological literacy around what. What does privacy actually mean? None of us actually own any of our data. We own very little of our data today. It's more important to think about if, how can we control what we don't own? What are the ways in which we can understand where does the data we use online go? Which cloud, which is actually a server somewhere in the middle of Norway, uh, what happens there? How does the data get? Who's farming the data? How many people are benefiting? I think that conversation is more important. Hi. Thank you for the lecture. Um, <clears throat> so something that I wanted to ask was whether you approached um, these projects or some of these projects uh, the perspective of the developer or the, the investor uh, spreading awareness to people that are consuming these deliverables. Um, I think it's really critical to have that conversation, but sometimes it sprouts from places that don't necessarily consider themselves becoming a potential threat, um, such as uh, Silicon Valley uh, developers or app developers who um, are working to create kiosks um, that instantly measure vitals, uh, things that are closer to the future that um, are in progress, but might need this angle? Or um, I guess the question is, have you tried to work with inventors or people such as this with current projects? Investors. Um, or the developers that are so into Like startups or? Sorry? Sort of startups, you mean? This yes, one? yeah. To show potential uh, outcomes. Um. Not directly, to be honest. I mean, we, um, 
we are um, uh, through the consultancy we are also starting a project around the internet of things where we are trying to raise funding to be able to create this sort of technological literacy around open data or how we can control our data if there were going to be sensors everywhere around us but um, I'm very suspicious of the Silicon Valley optimism and the technocratic view of the world and uh, um, it would be it would be hard to form a relationship that would enable us to do this sort of questioning. I have a feeling, but I'm open to trying trying things out. <laughs> Hi. Um, my question is related, I think, to what you're just starting to talk about. Because I was going to ask if you've ever had a conflict with a corporate client, um, and if you could tell us a, about that experience, if there, if there have been experiences where, because I interpret a lot of these projects as cautionary tales about where our relationship with technology may be going, but then you also in your consultancy work for some of these lead technological um, players. So I was just wondering if there have been moments when you've refused jobs or had to change the dialogue with them based on those views. Yeah. Definitely, um, it's a it's a difficult thing. You have to pay your rent. You have to work for corporations sometimes. Try and do as little as possible. But also, we do believe that by having the lab, and that's the only work we can actually show. We've managed to. Uh, we're starting now after a few years of practice to get the kind of clients, corporate clients, who are open to this kind of a conversation because we we can't really show any of our NDA work, corporate work. So one is that. Your, re your own research practice can actually start influencing the corporate world. We believe that it's happening. And um, yes, we've just recently walked away from a, a sponsor for the Drone Avery project. It has completely changed the project. It has caused us a lot of uh, disruption financially in terms of projects uh, because the sponsor wanted us to use the drones for product placement. And it was just absolutely not in line with the creative vision of the project. So we've scaled down the project. We've uh, decided to walk away with the creative vision and a smaller scale and no money. Thank you. I, oh, it is a sensitive microphone in defense to that first student. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the role of narrative form um, in your work. Um, you showed your early work as a filmmaker and then also the Corning, you know, the wonderful Corning video and, and talked a little bit about how narratives create expectations for our interface with technology, um, but then end up guiding technological production. Um, but also the, the implication seems to be that narratives can somehow help us um, complete fiction, utter, utter fiction, lies, right? The camera that can see into the future can, um, on the one hand, be an irony, be a kind of a, 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 um, a little bit humorous uh, and cause people to let their defenses down and kind of you know, think in new ways, but they can actually, those things can actually change our futures in some way. I'm, just, I'm curious what kind of narratives inspire you and what you think about narratives in your work. Um, yeah, no, I am deeply inspired by, um, like I, I studied as a filmmaker, so yes, I'm very inspired by what uh, films can do, but um, I think the problem with the, the Corning kind of videos is that it's extremely one-sided view. So I suppose what films and narratives can also reveal is the complexity, as I've said before. And they can, instead of leading us with a finger and showing us this world, fiction can also raise questions. Fish fictions can also ask us to contemplate about the reality that we might live in, not just present an advertisement. Someone saying, would you be comfortable with someone saying that your film, your drone film, is a kind of dystopic yeah. reaction to the utopia of the Corning film? Yeah, yeah. possibly, definitely. Um, I'm not for one suggesting that we don't have a point of view in our work. Absolutely do. Um, design is political. Um, everything you do, filmmaking is extremely political. The minute you place a camera somewhere and point at something as opposed to the other, you're making a subjective decision. But um, 
the, the drone video is also showing a reality as what CCTV platforms and the thousands of facial recognition camera uh, technology in CCTV cameras already in London in many parts of the world. So it's just making that visible in some ways as well. And um, it's a story that we are trying to say, which if, if it can be, if, if we can reach the scale of it being viewed as much as the Corning video is, I think that's job done. Thank you. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, my question revolves around that, what you kind of just responded to from the, the gentleman in the front's question. Um, I'm curious as to, as to if you have an internal conflict when it comes to presenting work like Corning, where you have this like very like positive and, and upbeat and almost like 1950s new cabinetry um, film aesthetic and layout, where everyone's like very happy and, and present for the work. Um, that's glass, and then you you respond to that with the new the reaction to the drone work, which is very um, in in step with like modern America's response to to the new like implementation of drones in surveillance at a within the country. Um, do you feel like with with allowing the viewer to respond to the work? and allowing us to like make our minds up on ourselves, but having those narratives being so severely like set in a, a very like positive or a very um, challenging direction. Do you feel like there's kind of a, a duality to saying you can make up your own mind, but it's only under the pretenses of what I've shown you? Um. Um, so let me, let me um, if what I've understood correctly is that the Corning video is taking you in a certain direction whilst the drone film is taking you down another route. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I was only using those as, as like the two. Examples, like, yeah. Because those are the ones that were presented. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just questioning whether or not like with the positiveness of the Corning video, yeah. but still allowing the viewer to like take the work as they may, uh -huh. um, am I supposed to react to the Corning video in a sarcastic manner? Right. Um, or is it, I mean, I only, I only ask for like, for the stabilization of the work. Um, I think, I think we just, I think here we are within a very sort of aware group of people, but the Corning video, uh, people have watched it, millions of people have watched it, and even if they don't take it seriously, I do believe that a lot of these videos bombarded us every day in our lives, start influencing the way we think about future technology. And I'm hoping that creating, even if it's dystopic or messy or complicated future or alternative narratives, um, if some people can go away thinking about next time they see a drone uh, advertisement about what it might actually do, the fact that these drones actually even have sensors on them, then that's, uh, uh, then that's then then we managed to get them down that route. Do you that, feel like your standing for modern um, technology is um, inconsistent or or honest? Sorry. Can I mean, like, I'm I'm asking a question about like, do you feel like um, reflecting to Corning, which is like a modern company, co not modern. Corning is a long-standing company. They've mm. been presenting glass for mm. like hundreds of years, hundreds of years. Hmm. It's been a long day. Um, do you feel like representing Corning with this very like sunny side up reflection of their like home works where you can like sweep your dining room table off and then use it as a tennis board and do your taxes, but then responding to drones which can work positively for people or negatively in the same way that like having a glass table that you do your taxes on can work for you positively or negatively, do you think that there's like inconsistency in that presentation, or do you think it's honest for both segments? Um, I see what you mean. Okay, so no, it's not honest. I don't think Corning is honest at all. <laughs> I think um, it's an advertisement. Um, with the drones, as with any project, when we think about a technology, it's got many sides to it. And I think we decide to take a certain interest in a certain part of the technology and run with that. So with the drones project, we're not so interested in the fact that three drones can fly and do a dance or whether they can, they will be journalist drones and they will do surveillance and they will do traffic monitoring. We are interested in the machine and what the machine can do once it starts becoming autonomous. And so that's the part we are interested in and so we're gonna go down that route. 
and we're going to try and be uh, we're going to do as much research as we can to make that narrative that makes sense so yeah um, good evening uh, with uh, respect to the context of what you've presented us um, how do you feel about the future personally Uh, slightly nervous, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> I have a two and a half year old son, so I'm very, very invested in what happens in the future, much more than I was before. Um, when people say, oh, how can you think about anything 10 years from now, 15, it's too far. I always remind them that 2030 is closer than 1995. So actually, um, one of the reasons we think about what the work we do is because um, I'm I'm by large optimistic, but I'm I'm also nervous. Thank you.